In the mid-1970s, DoD came onto the scene and almost instantly became a guitar pedal powerhouse, so much so that they were referred to as America's Pedals. I've collected these for years and years, and I love them. But recently, something caught my eye. It seems that there's a sub-series within the normal releases that they put out in the 1990s. And today, I'm going to walk you through what I refer to as the Lamb Series. In the 1990s, as Digitech, the digital partner company to DoD, continued to expand, the leader of DoD, John Johnson, decided to go fully into Digitech and commit all of his time to its growth. In doing so, he handed over the entire DoD pedal line to a punk rocking skateboarder named Jason Lamb. Hence why I call this series we're about to look at the Lamb series. Let's look at each pedal why they're cool, why they're weird, and some quirky facts about each one. Jason Lamb's first contribution to DoD comes through the FX69 Grunge. Let me hold it up against a rather normal DoD pedal from around the same era and kind of point out the blaringly obvious contrast that caught my eye, kind of turned me on to this Jason Lamb subseries. DoD is kind of known for their plain Jane aesthetic, real simple colors, normal fonts, and typical knob controls like you would have seen on a boss pedal or whatever. You have level, tone, and distortion on this one. But when you look at the grunge, you see something really, really different. A multicolor enclosure that's airbrushed, crazy graphics, and knob controls that don't make a lot of sense at first glance. Like, what is butt? What is face? What does the grunge knob actually do? This is absolutely Jason Lamb and his amazing personality going right into a guitar pedal and kind of forever changing DoD. This pedal was really, really successful. It came in on the heels of grunge and it sold about 2,000 units a month. I need you to know that that's crazy. That's actually insanely good and uh, really, really impressive. Well, Kurt Cobain gets it, puts it on his board because Honestly, he's just fascinated that there's a pedal that says grunge. They're the ultimate grunge band. And he puts it on there kind of to troll people, you know, just to, just to have some fun. His tech says it was on there for several months and he never ever turns it on. But MTV interviews him at a live concert and says, Kurt, why do Nirvana's guitars sound so cool? Why are they so awesome? And he holds up the DoD grunge and he says, well, it's the DoD grunge, of course. From that moment on, they went from 2,000 cells a month, which is amazing, to 8,000 cells a month. This is a massively successful pedal. At this point, Jason Lamb is not yet over the DoD pedal line, but because of this, when John Johnson moves on to take his reign at Digitech, he knows he can put Jason Lamb over the pedal series and it'll be massively successful. Let me read from the manual and we're gonna listen to it. The FX69 Grunge is a hypercharged, high gain preamp, so nasty and so heavy, it'll have all your bandmates screaming for mercy. Even its distortion is distorted. The circuit is primarily a heavily modified and very fancy, cool rat circuit. Let's listen to it. <laughs> comes one year after the grunge in 1994. It is the Buzzbox FX33. It has controls labeled heavy, buzz, saw, and thrust, and a crazy yellow splattered paint job. This is a pretty crazy pedal, and honestly, it does sound broken, and people had issue with this. A lot of dealers were getting returns, they couldn't explain it, so DoD actually added the tagline into the marketing. It's not broken, it sounds that way. This is an attempt for DoD to capture the sound of Buzz Osborne of the Melvin's guitar sound. And that's a really smart thing because a young Kurt Cobain really, really loved the Melvins. And with the success of the grunge a year earlier, this is them diving in and trying to capitalize on that same market. 
I do have a really fascinating quote from the actual guy himself. Um, here it is. This is King Buzzo's reaction in a Guitar World February 95 interview. They asked him if he had anything to do with the DoD buzz box, and he says, I had nothing to do with it. I mean, does my guitar really sound that bad? The guys at DoD are kind of crazy, and I have to give them credit for that. A guy there was always bugging me at shows about how we got the sound on the eggnog record. That's Jason Lamb. I use this thing called a blue box. It's an old octave from the early 70s. So this guy says, I want to design a pedal. We'll call it the buzz box, and we'll get that sound out of it. But it wasn't so much that he wanted to do an endorsement or anything. I think he just likes the sound. So he came to one of our shows, he looked inside the blue box, he kind of duplicated it, and he combined it with the grunge pedal and made a new pedal. I have to admire DoD for putting out something that insane. Yes, the buzz box is totally worthless. It sounds like a vacuum cleaner. Let's listen to this. That was really interesting. Really great sound. Uh, let's move on to the same year, if you can do that. 1994, again, we have the FX86 death metal. So death metal is a genre. It started in the mid 80s and it reached its height in the mid 90s when this pedal came out. Jason Lamb being a punk rocker and a big part of the music scene, metal scene, all this. He knew this genre well, so put a pedal into it and mark it to those people. I'm gonna read from the manual because with controls like RIP, rest in peace of course, guts, pain, and a scream knob, we gotta see what this thing's all about. It says, the FX86 creates a grinding wall of noise perfect for harmonic corruption of the highest order. The FX86 emulates the death metal and grindcore sounds of napalm death carcass, brutal truth, pungent stench, and others. One advantage of the FX86 is that it will oscillate when the rest in peace control is turned up. I need to turn that up. Allowing oscillation at any amp volume. There is no distortion control. We just turned it up and ripped it off. One more pedal from 1994 in this series is the Meatbox FX32. It actually says US DOD Prime Meatbox. This paint job is extravagantly beautiful. It is a slab of marbled meat. The box came with a little set of fly stickers. You can see one here. Um, basically, you just put some flies on your slab of meat and you move on. This is a really crazy pedal that was designed for bass guitar but found itself being used by more electric guitarists. Uh, it's an octave distortion fuzz, kind of really bizarre octave device that goes really, really low in the frequency range. With controls like meat, rump, flank, and pounds, I really, really think it needs to be heard and that's what I'm here to do to hear this, to play this, so you can hear this, the slab of meat. The next pedal comes from 1995. It is the FX76 Punkifier. 76 is actually a tribute to the year that punk rock went mainstream, 1976. 
And I think this pedal was a lot of fun for Jason Lamb because he was a punk rocker. He was in a lot of local bands in Salt Lake and it had to be really, really fun for him. There are two different versions of this cosmetically. One has a different undercoat. And if you're super nerdy and, and you're kind of like me and you don't have a problem, uh, it's gonna haunt you that you don't have all the colors. Not that I'm being haunted that I don't have this other color. I just wanna throw that out there. This pedal is also kinda well known because the guitarist of Blur used it on several records along with his Proco Rat. Uh, the knobs are punk, slam, spikes, and one of my personal favorite knob controls ever, even in the future, probably never see anything this good, menace. You turn the menace knob, it's menacing, it's a menace itself. I don't know what it does, it just changes stuff, and that's what a knob should do. I want to turn it and stuff's different, it changes. <laughs> The next pedal was released at Winter Nam 1996, and it was DoD's first overdrive pedal in a long time since the FX53 Classic Tube. So that's pretty significant. There are two cosmetically different ones. I'm not bothered by that. And it's pretty much a straight ahead overdrive with controls like Sweet, Pulp, Tang, and Juice. It's kind of normal for this line, but it's not really normal because we all know what normal is and this isn't normal. release was the FX13 Gonculator Modulator. This was uh, the second pedal of this series I ever owned and it's really crazy. It is once again the grunge pedal in parallel with a ring modulator. Uh, the controls are suck, smear, gunk, and heave. Um, those are really easy to understand what they're gonna do. And it was used and kind of made famous by Incubus on a song called Glass. These basically were not successful, and then they became very, very expensive on the used market. There is a reissue of this uh, that they did later, so you can check that out as well. I want to read from the manual. It says, the FX13 Gonculator Modulator is a ring modulator and distortion in one. The ring modulator, or smear, adds gong-like gonk tones to your guitar sound. With the suck and smear knobs, you can create a multitude of bizarre distortion sounds that will not only enhance your solos, but it'll keep the audiences wondering. The pedal also came out in 1996. It is the FX101 Grind, rectifying overdrive with echo. I hate to tell you, DoD, but this is not an overdrive. It is a full-blown distortion that rips your head off. Uh, it basically is letting you get that Mesa dual rectifier triple rec sound. That's what they're going for here. They're going for that crowd, those kind of people. And uh, the knobs are Blast, Rumble, Burn, and Fear. That's a good knob name. You also see something that kind of starts happening here in this year. Some of these pedals show the normal labeling, like level, lows, highs, and gains. So they're kind of marketing to two crowds, the people that want to turn the Fear knob or the guy or girl that just want to turn the Gain knob. This pedal came out on the same day as the FX100. They share the same circuit board. They're nearly identical. They both have a really cool cab emulator, which was kind of a big deal for the 90s. Uh, this is definitely a Jason Lamb era design. He helped design it, was a big part of it, but the knobs are not labeled crazy, so I'm really torn on even showing it, even though I just showed it. I think we need to just listen to this, and I'm going to play what comes to mind with a triple rec, double rectifier by Mesa. I liked, uh, I liked Creed for a while, and I'm not ashamed of it. I don't talk about it unless it's to thousands of people at this moment, which I'm really second guessing. I hope you enjoy what's about to happen, because I am. The 
The next pedal comes from 1997. It's simply called the Corrosion. It is this pedal, which was released a year earlier and didn't really do that well. So they put the circuit in this case and uh, they gave it controls called Dissolve, Bottom, Top, and Rust. It has no paint, which is kind of cool. Um, it's really odd. And there is another cosmetic version of this. This is the most rare looking one, and I'm, I'm proud of that. I, I do want to say I work hard to, to gather these things. You know, I feel better about myself and stuff. It's probably a problem. I really rely on the pedals too much, I guess. Also from 1996 is the Supersonic Stereo Flange FX 747. Pause. 747? Supersonic? Anybody but me connecting the dots? It's probably just me. It's fine. It has controls, payload, mock, altitude, and thrust. It's a really good modulation pedal. It actually is analog bucket brigade as an MN3007. It is essentially a recased FX75, but I don't care. And mine has little stickers. There's fish and turtles. There's like a squirrel riding a paper airplane. Frogs and capes. You're not going to have that. You can find this, but you're never going to find the frog cape thing. I have something you'll never have. None of you will have that. I'm sorry, he forgot to eat lunch that day. Winternam 96 gave us a lot of things. Here's another one. It is the FX84 Milk Box Compressor. I have to hand it to them, a guy who has a compressor called the Whitey Tidy. They have a compressor called the Milk Box with cow udders and knobs labeled such as this. Quartz, cream, and you get to choose between skim, 1%, 2% or whole milk, you have pasteurization level and spill. I can't describe how happy this pedal makes me. Um, it's really, it's a good one. It's, it's full of puns, it's full of magic. I actually have the box here. Nobody cares. And this is worth staring at for a moment. Let's all just, just look at this with me. I, I love this. I love this stuff. I love pedals. Have I ever told you guys that? I love them. Another beauty from 1996 is the FX64 Icebox Stereo Chorus. There's actually a deep freeze chorus. I don't have that one. I don't need it though. I don't need it. It's fine. It has controls called Ice Cold. Ice Cold. Deep and Freeze. Deep Freeze. Anybody? Just me. It's fine. This also, you see level speed depth and high EQ up there because some people, they don't want to turn the deep knob. They want to turn the depth knob. Yeah, this is Bucket Brigade. That's a big deal. I don't know what else to say. It was like 130 bucks new in 96. Maybe my pedals are priced pretty fairly. Maybe? Yeah, I think they are. <laughs> last pedal is one that I didn't know existed until about two weeks ago. I found out about it, went on to Reverb, had it shipped here, and it's in my hand. It was made for one year only for Musician's Friend. It is the FX70P, 
because it's the big pig fat distortion. Just look at that color. It's like a dirty pink pig color. It's amazing. It's basically the grunge, the corrosion, the metal X. It's like that same circuit that they just kept using. It's a good circuit. Use it. That's what they did. I'm going to turn that wallow, snort, wheeze, and mud knob, and we're going to get down and dirty because dirt pedals are dirty and pigs are dirty. Pigs are dirty, and I want to play this dirty pig pedal. <laughs> Today's record time is brought to you by grunge. Not the pedal we keep talking about today, but the genre. I'm gonna show you two of my favorite albums from the era. Definitely albums that inspired and kind of fueled DOD and its growth at this time in the 90s. First up is Nirvana Nevermind. If you're watching this episode, it's highly unlikely you don't know about this. If you haven't, it is a must. It's so important that I can't even talk about it. I need like three hours and I'm gonna move on. But listen to it and in the comments, let's talk about our favorite songs, what it meant to you when it came out, all that good stuff. My favorite track is In Bloom and On a Plane. There's a song on here called Territorial Pissings as well and it actually had settings in the grunge manual that told you how to tune the grunge pedal to sound like that song. And next up is my absolute favorite album from this era. It is Pearl Jam Vitalogy. Pearl Jam is the reason I play guitar and this album is massive for me. It's super, super important musically. I love it. It gets overlooked, but it is a masterpiece record. If you know Pearl Jam from songs like Jeremy Alive, Even Flow, that's a good record. Those are good songs, but this is a whole other level. The songwriting is phenomenal. Instrumentation, Brendan O'Brien's work, the whole thing is just really, really epic. In the comments, let's talk about these two records. If you haven't heard them, I wanna hear what you think about them. If you have heard them and love them, let's talk about the songs, and then you tell me your favorite records from the 90s in that grunge Seattle scene. Thanks so much for watching this episode. I had an absolute blast diving into this history and into this story. I wanna dedicate this to the great, amazing work of Jason Lamb, who sadly passed away in 2016, just as he was starting a new pedal venture. His work in the guitar industry is really, really amazing. And it's so easy to overlook the fact that companies don't do things people do. It's easy to look at Fender or Gibson or Marshall or DOD or Boss and really put a big, big kind of cloud over these important people that did things. Jason's work is pivotal to this industry. It's pivotal to why I have a job. It's pivotal to why we love guitar pedals. So because of that, I dedicate this episode to him. I also want to give a big huge thanks to John Johnson, to Tom Cram and Bob Bailey, all involved with DOD in this time period or a little bit after. And they really helped me get a grip for this story. There's also an epic website called America's Pedals, DOD. Just Google that and you'll find it. So much information. I want to find the guy that put that together. If you're watching this, please contact me. I want to do something with you. These are the notes from this. It is page after page after page. I was on phone calls and just an intense amount of information diving into this. And this is a really good example of the things I want to share on our Patreon page because I can't cover everything in these historical episodes. There's so much cool stuff that's so important. So I'm going to be putting content on that Patreon once we get it launched and it'll be things like this. You're going to get to hear a lot more really cool stories and I'm excited for that. If you like this episode, hit like, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to get notifications of future episodes. Also, also go check out the JHS Show website in the description below. Have a wonderful day. Buy some DOD and remember Jason Lamb. Other than that, let's get out of here. <laughs>